Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Lal. Now, after that introduction, it, I feel quite small whether I'll be able to, uh, to uh, fulfill the expectations um, of you uh, tonight. But I really want to say thank you for the, for the introductions. I'm also very happy to see a lot of people here. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to this public lecture. <laughs> and I hope that this lecture will be useful for you uh, and also uh, interesting and uh, uh, entertaining. I'd like to say a very good evening to all invited guests, visitors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and may I uh, uh, at this stage also uh, um, acknowledge the presence of uh, Professor Gerald West with us here tonight. Um, I met Professor Gerald West in 2003 in Johannesburg during a uh, transforming theological education consultation that was organized by the Council for World Mission. And then it was during that time that I uh, um, uh, started to fall in love with, uh, with his writings and I have been uh, using quite a lot of his work in the work that I do here in the region. I just want to highlight that at the very beginning since he's here um, with us. I wish to register my thanks to the organizers of the public lecture series on reweaving the ecological mat, ecology and social justice. And these ha have already been mentioned, the Institute for Mission and Research of the Pacific Theological College, the Pacific Regional Seminary, and the University of the South Pacific. Also at this time, secondly, uh, we have uh, know that the cyclone has just gone past Fiji and there has been quite a fair bit of destruction and loss in other parts of the country. And therefore, I would like to ask us to observe a moment of silence and let us bring to mind those families, communities who have been affected by the tropical cyclone Kenny. Thank you very much. The topic and the challenges that it presents. <coughs> As you can see, if you have the program, the topic for this public lecture is responding to domestic violence and ecumenical voice to broken families. However, before proceeding any further, I think it is important to make some brief comments on three similar terminologies that are used in the concept note that you have in the program. And these are violence against women, gender-based violence, and domestic violence. Sometimes these terminologies are used interchangeably. However, according to the relevant United Nations documents, they are both distinct as well as overlapping aspects. I just want to highlight three of these. <laughs> one, Article 1 of the Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women states that, I quote, the term violence against women means any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts coercion or arbitrary deprivation of liberty, whether occurring in public or in private life, unquote. So in other words, violence against women, according to this declaration, is inclusive of all forms and all contexts of gender-based violence, public of and private. Number two, the CEDAW, General Recommendation Number 19, and Article 3, Istanbul Convention, outlines gender-based violence as, and again I quote, violence directed against a woman because she is a woman, or that affects women disproportionately. It includes acts that inflict physical, mental, or sexual harm or suffering, threats of such acts, coercion, and other deprivation of liberty, unquote. So, GBV or gender-based violence is perpetrated on women 
because of their sex, as well as because of the various female stereotypical roles. And three, domestic violence, according to Article 3 Istanbul Convention and the explanatory reports, mean, and I quote, all acts of physical, sexual, psychological, or economic violence within the family or domestic unit, or between former or current spouses or partners, whether or not the perpetrator shares or has shared the same residence with the victim. The two main forms of domestic violence are intimate partner violence between current or former spouses or partners, and intergenerational violence, which typically occurs between parents and children, unquote. So domestic violence includes aspects of both violence against women and gender-based violence, as well as violence against children within the family or the home. So against this background, I see the, from the concept note that these terminologies are used together almost interchangeably or synonymously. And this is a challenge because the term domestic confines violence within the family or within the domestic unit, whereas violence against women and gender-based violence can and do go beyond and happen outside the confines of a family or domestic unit. Now, given these initial hurdles and and uh, the due consultations I have with the key organizers, uh, we have decided to use the terminology violence against women in its broad terms because it is more inclusive, covering violence both in public and in private spheres, and at the same time including gender-based violence. So shifting to this, uh, slight shifting to this violence against women will still address the subtopic of an ecumenical voice to broken families. Approach of an academic and an activist. Now, after this uh, introduction, I will now outline my approach to the topic, responding to violence against women and ecumenical voice to broken families. I used to be an academic, well, I thought so. Um, I used to think I was when I was here. Now I'm not too sure. Perhaps I still am. Uh, because since early 2014, I have very much been an activist in the fight against gender inequalities and violence against women, violence against girls, and violence against children in several countries and various churches throughout this region. The big difference is that I joined the struggle as a theologian and work to tackle violence from theological and biblical perspectives, which is still, in a way, following the human rights tradition, but it is deeply theological and biblical. As much as possible, I strive to combine a level of academic and scholarly knowledge and research with practical work on the ground a combination which I like to believe is just starting to make inroads into protected and sensitive territories and beginning to create small ripples in one's undisturbed waters around our region. I like to think that this lecture is an extension of this combination of a degree of critical academics analysis and reflection with various examples of concrete and tangible work on the ground with and by the churches at various <coughs> levels of church leadership around the region. I must highlight a very important point at this juncture. This combination of critical academic scholarly approach with the practical and praxeological approach is embodied in the ways in which my wife, she's here, and I have worked together these past years in our shared effort and passion to address gender inequalities and violence against women. We have gainfully discovered that both approaches add value and strength to each other. They depend on each other and they need 
each other. The ecological map. There is indeed a degree of attract attractiveness about the concept of ecological map. It goes without saying that math in many Pacific cultures continues to be a metaphor for many positive things, including talanoa, fellowship, sharing, egalitarianism, reconciliation and peace, the Fonga ritual in Samoa being one of the examples of this, friendship, rest, knowledge, and connectedness to one another and to the world of nature, more closely our terrestrial surroundings. So all is well and good. However, I would like to ask some questions which, which may be provocative and un uncomfortable. Who engages in Talanoa around the spread mat? Who takes part in sharing around the spread mat? How is sharing done and who is given the best, the most important parts? Who takes the leftovers? <laughs> For those of you in Kiribati, I'm, I'm married to a woman who is Kiribati. I call, uh, she is from Micropoli, which means she is from Micronesia and Polynesia. And from experience, our first appointment was to a Kiribati community. And one of the first challenges that we encountered was when we went to the Maneba, there are pillars around the Maneba, the meeting hall, and each of the pillars belonged to an elder. And I was the chief of the elders, so I had the most important pillar around the meeting hall. The elders seated us, the wives sit at the back with all the children. When mealtime came, we ate first. My wife and the others ate second. And so both of us resisted this idea. And I said, this is not something that we would like to continue. My wife is not at my back. She is not behind me. She is beside me. From now on, she will sit next to me in front. They understood. And so my wife started sitting next to me in front. Just some of the challenges. So who takes the central or front positions on the spread mat? Who takes the peripheral or the back seats or the back position? Who has no place at all on the spread mat? Whose knowledge and what knowledge are passed on around the spread mat? I leave these questions and many more questions for you to contemplate. And I'm pretty sure you have your own questions to ask as well. The term ecological is one which I, I must acknowledge is very close to my heart. I'm already telling you my bias here. And this is because of its richness as a metaphor and the power and the potential it has to inform and to challenge. And according to Ernst Conradi, it helps to integrate several concerns on the social agenda of the church. Again, Conradi, Ernst Conradi says, the power of this metaphor lies in its ability to integrate especially three core ecumenical themes on the basis of the Greek word oikos. Now, I will briefly explore these three themes and then make the connection with the lecture topic for tonight. Acknowledging that there are experts in the Greek language amongst us tonight, I will nevertheless attempt to shed some light on the Greek word oikos and on its three derivatives that are relevant for this lecture, namely ecological, economical, and ecumenical. These three words derive from the same Greek word oikos, which means household, according to some uh, scholars, home, or dwelling place. Ecology comes from two Greek words, oikos and logos, <laughs> where logos generally means word or even study. I'm pretty sure all of us who are here know where the word logos comes out very, very popularly in the New Testament, which is in the Gospel according to John. 